Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming, and thanks to the Metrograph. They have an amazing staff for uh, making this possible. Um, I'll keep it brief. I just wanted to say that uh, it's very exciting because I have not seen this film on 35 millimeter in, I would say, about 35 or 36 years. So I'm excited, a little nervous, because it's very different when you see little video clips than when you actually watch the whole film with an audience on a big screen. Um, but um, the other thing I wanted to say about it is, uh, you know, so it was made in 1987, and one of the inspirations uh, for making this film was that I've always been a big fan of screwball comedies, especially screwball comedies from the 1930s and early 40s. And I love those actresses like Katherine Hepburn and Carol Lombard and Rosalind Russell, and you know, because they were really feisty, uh, smart, and stylish women. And so those women were the inspiration, uh, in part, for the character that's played by Anne Magnuson. And, um, you know, the intention was to kind of make social commentary, but also to be kind of fun and entertaining. So I hope you'll find the film fun and entertaining. <laughs> I hope I will as well when I watch it again. <laughs> Um, so thank you all for coming. I appreciate you. Stick around for the Q and A. All right. Please welcome the moderator for today's Q and A, Karen Coleman from the Future of Films Filipino. Please join me in welcoming the great Susan Simon. <laughs> I'm small, I'm gonna stand. <laughs> Is that okay? That's okay. You can sit, I can stand, you could both stand. Is this, uh... this was so great to see this in a theater, and that print was really beautiful. It was, it, it's interesting to see 35 millimeter when you're so used to digital. Yes. yes. Um, I have a question. It's hard for me to see everybody, but um, who was seeing this for the first time right now? Okay, great. <laughs> um, I was wondering that we were talking earlier about who the, who the audience would be. Um, so I, I want to start off by talking about this idea that films have lives. I, I'm very interested in this idea of what iterations the film goes through every decade. And it usually seems that only every 35, 40 years it kind of comes back. What is it like for you, because you said you hadn't watched in a while, but then also in this kind of new realm where technology is ever present in our lives? Yeah. Uh, is, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm not, yeah. It, I'm, I'm still a little, I gotta be honest, I'm a little dazed because I haven't seen it on a big screen or with an audience in 37 years. And so I was a little nervous that, you know, sometimes you see films that you had fun making and then, or you had fun watching when you were a child and then you see them again and you go, oh, you know, that really did not hold up. And so it was interesting for me to see how, you know, what the audience laughed at, oh, what yes. I laughed at, um, and also to think about technology in a different way because Androids and IA and all that is so thought of so differently now than back then. Yeah. Um, this was made in eighty in the eighties, obviously, and uh, it was coming out of the decade of um, dark uh, dystopian. There, there were actually two kinds of ways of dealing with IA. That, in my opinion, yeah. You know, the, the kind of Blade Runner version where you know, it's very scary and dark. And then there was also the kind of romantic comedy version in which it was sort of a male,
fantasy version of like weird science is an example of that kind of movie. Yes. Uh, a, a man creating a woman from a computer program and a Barbie doll. <laughs> yes. Um, so it, to me just, uh, you know, I was surprised that it didn't age in the same way I was scared it might. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> and I was also um, surprised because I forgot a lot of the dialogue that I, I laughed because I forgot yes. the dynamic between, you know. Uh, There's so many yeah, funny, yeah. funny yeah. quips in mine. Yeah. And, and the other thing that, that I remembered was how much fun it was working with the actors. I mean, I look at John Malkovich playing both those roles, and he was able to make them just through little gestures and body language so different. Uh, Anne Magnuson, I think, She's is, so is just great. And you don't see, at that time, many leading ladies playing those kinds of roles in the 80s. Yes. And also Laurie Metcalf. What can you say about <laughs> You know, the woman is I think amazing. Was, I, would, I was telling you that I, after rewatching this, I watched that sort of seeking Susan, and I was just so happy to see Laurie Metcalf again. Like, I was like, she, she's everything. She's so a chameleon. I mean, she can just change and be so many different things. So, uh, yeah. Well, one of the things that I, I and there's a, there's a line in the film that I think um, still makes it evergreen. And it's the uh, the concept of a woman would really confuse him, and I feel <laughs> like this is true today, but also true of most of the male characters in this film. Um, and perhaps the only one who's not confused is Ulysses. <laughs> yeah, because he's been programmed by a woman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I want to talk about you talked about it not being set in this dark dystopian place like 2001 or Blade Runner, and it's not shot in New York um, yeah. like your previous two films were. What was the choice for Miami and Miami Beach specifically? Yeah, well, I knew that this was, even though it's a sci-fi Pygmalion story, Yes. Um, uh, I knew it, it was also a romantic comedy, and I wanted it to be vibrant, and I thought that, um, setting in South Florida for a couple of reasons. One was uh, that the space program was, is, was based, or is based in Florida. Um, so I thought that would be appropriate. And also, this was about different cultures, in the K or, uh, you know, an android falling in love with a human. And the thing that I liked about Miami was that it really is a mix of cultures, you know, there's, oh, yeah. uh, you see that in the wedding, but you see it, you know, even just with the little things, what, uh, say, hablo Yiddish, yeah. you know, that little <laughs> sign uh, that's <laughs> uh, at the newsstand. But that idea of, of mixing cultures, of everyone kind of figuring out how to get along together in some way, I thought it was sort of a, a positive spin and a colorful spin on a what's usually seen as a dark subject matter. And also, it, just for those of you who have ever been to South Beach or whatever, this was filmed in, we filmed it in 86, it came out in 87, and South Beach was still kind of a place where it was a, a all, all those, now they're all restaurants and kind Very of expensive hotels. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we're, we're old age homes, basically. So the neighborhood was just kind of changing, which was interesting. And where else are you going to get all those pink and yellow and lime green Art Deco buildings? Um, so the location had a cheerfulness to it that I wanted to capture. And I like how there's some the alludes to you know technology at the time the VCR and the yeah. car phone. Yeah, um, I had a car phone like that. Um, but it, it it's so interesting that it's placed like in an everyday reality. Yeah, um, which I think yeah. is what makes it work. And yet they're not surprised that there is a robot man walking around. It's and a I like tone. That. Yeah. It was like you know it's. Obviously, androids, I mean, it's a futuristic thing, but it also, for me, it, you know, I wanted to do a retro sci-fi movie. Yeah. 
So a lot of, like if you look at the graphics and the mid-century design of everything, it was sort of inspired by when I was a kid and went to the World's Fair in New York. I guess it was like 1963 or 64. But that idea of the world of tomorrow, yes. that it was like a cheerful kind of, you know, an optimistic version <laughs> of the future. Or, you know, growing up as a kid watching the Jetsons cartoons, you know, with Rosie the, I think the maid was, Kind of a friendly yes. robot, yeah. right? So it was it was uh, not fearful about AI and technology. Well, it's nice to kind of watch something like this now when we are so fearful <laughs> yeah. of the future of technology. Yeah. I would love for you to talk a little bit more about what you mentioned in regards to the gender swap of um, not creating the perfect woman, like yeah. a like pretty woman or weird science, yeah. but kind of creating the perfect man yeah well i it, one of the inspirations for the story i mean it is a you know a, there's elements of frankenstein in there hence her name frankie stone there's elements of you know it's a pygmalion story and in the 80s there were a lot of those kinds of stories but it was always a man creating the perfect woman it was mm -hmm. or or um you know, what, like Splash, you know, he, the man, leading man falls in love with a fish, or a mermaid. Um, mannequin, the leading man falls in love with a mannequin. So I thought it would be fun to kind of flip that myth on its head and, and to use it to be able to say something about, you know, the relationship between men and women and, and also, to allow, again, going back to the screwball comedy influence, you know, like I love the, some of those scenes between Frankie and Jeff, just little things, like that scene where they're in the, uh, Dr. Rondas's office and he, they're sitting on opposite sides of the couch, just that little banter there. And um, when she leaves and he's like, yeah, I, I told you. Great, like, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Well, I'm so excited that you mentioned the Frankenstein uh, element to it because there's my two questions, last questions are sort of tied into this. Um, on the one hand, I couldn't help but watch this after seeing Four Things, um, and um, which is a writer, a man, and a director creating a woman Frankenstein character, right. although organic. Um, but the way that Ella Baxter discovers the world very clumsily is very similar to mm -hmm. how Ulysses does that. Yeah. And um, and I love, there was a, the quote of something that you sent me, that Roger Eber um, wrote, which says, with this film, Seidelman hits her stride as a comedy director who would rather be clever than obvious, who allows good actors such as Malkovich to go for quiet effects rather than broad, dumb cliches. And I would love for you to talk about what you and John Malkovich kind of discussed and how he would approach this sort of childlike stuff into going and, and being mature and, and love. Yeah, I and I wish I could answer that. It's been you know, it's been a long time. Yes. But but <laughs> I, I know that for for me and I remember for him too. You know, actors love specifics, they love details. And as a film director, I mean, I love the overall story, but what always interests me beyond the overall story are just the little things you can say about how people act, you know, social interactions and, you know, uh, you know, every little, just details that most people might not even pick up on, like, you know, when Frankie drives into the shopping mall in her car, there's a movie theater in the background and it's the parent trap. It's an in-joke for me, but it's a, you know, it's a film about obviously mistaken identities and doubles as that film was, which I loved when I was growing up. Um, but also just getting the little details of a character right. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think, John, when he was developing both of those characters, just found the little, you know, just the way he manipulates his glasses, the kind of geeky way he does it is, is just 
perfect. Um, uh, again, it's it's wonderful for me to see this because I I forgot how good. I mean, I he's a great actor, but I hadn't seen this in so long. And this was one of the first times he had done full on comedy. This was yeah. I, again, I like using people in different mm -hmm. ways than they've been seeing them in, in a different light. And and John was a very well respected theater actor. He had done I think. You said maybe more, but I just remember one other movie called Places in the Heart where he mm -hmm. played a, a very dramatic role. And so this was his first comedy, and he gets to play two comedic characters. And of course, Anne Magnuson, if, if you, you know, in Smithereens, she was the cigarette girl. You know, she had a little part, but she stood out. So there was something about her that I thought was just right. There was something about her dry tone and just the you know she was together but uh, but frazzled at the yes. same time so vulnerable but strong and i think a lot of women can relate to that today sorry <laughs> i think a lot of women can relate to that today like yes. that seems something yeah. that has not yeah. changed a lot yeah. um my last question is still on the, on the sort of frankenstein element in which um you know jack is creating this character that's embodying his need for solitude mm -hmm. And then Frankie comes in and wants him to embody like her need for a non-problematic man in her life. And um, then we get Ulysses at the end. Mm -hmm. What do you think that he represents? This might be a difficult question, but what do you think he represents now versus then? Um, somebody who doesn't, hasn't pitched and told her story in a stereotypical female role. I mean, he just respects her as a person, loves her as a person. And uh, so so they're not so identified or traditionally gender yes. specific. I yes. guess that was one of the things that I noticed now or you know, was there in the script um, that I think is in some ways even you know, that, that passes the test of time and maybe is even more relevant today in some ways because when the film came out, it got mixed reviews. You know, there were some people like Ebert who liked it and gave it a great review. There were some people like uh, Siskel, <laughs> you know, who you were know, like, um, on the right side of that. <laughs> So, so it, it, I, I think it's viewed a little differently these days than when it, when it came out. And the other thing that was so interesting that I was thinking about coming over here is that you can't imagine how complicated it was in 1986 to do those scenes where uh, Malkovich is playing opposite Malkovich. We had mm. uh, like motion control cameras, huge con computers. I mean, it took forever to do that, those kinds of shots. Yeah. And now, like a seven-year-old with a cell phone can do it. <laughs> um, and they did. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd love to open it up to the audience with any questions. If you have a question, just raise your hand, and they will come by with the microphone. So if you get the microphone, you can ask. Hi. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm a very big fan. I played hooky from school to see this movie on the opening day uh, on the Upper East Side. Uh, uh, but anyway, yes, I just you to looking, about, can you raise your hand? Yes, oh, there. Right. Okay, yeah. Uh, I was curious about the design elements because the movie is impeccably designed. From yeah. Country, and every, you know, in a way that I, you just don't see at that time in this, just like the cinematography of Ed Lock. Did you yeah. just production design the costumes? Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about that approach because, you know, there's been a lot of movies since then that have sort of this curation of design, but at the time, I. I Recall that. I want to ask: Will those hands keep the Herring shoes? And then yes, so uh, Keith Herring did. Did she, he was a friend of Anne's, and he designed the shoes uh, oh. for the film. Um, we were going for that kind of mid-century retro feel. So you look at the furniture, you look at the. the uh, well, interestingly, about the costumes, um, if you if you look the. Her costumes are always very geometric. You know, her, her professional look is very um, architectural, almost. Uh, 
But in the scenes where you see her at home, she's wearing flowered stuff, she's wearing prints. That was a very, you know, her home life is messier. Her personal life is messier than her professional life, and that was reflected in the costumes. Um, interestingly, the production designer, uh, Barbara Ling, went on, I think, maybe she's done other things since this, but she did the last Tarantino movie, um, the one in Hollywood, what, what was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, so she went on to do a lot of other things, but she was also, she, Ed, I, uh, you know, Miami in that mid-century and Art Deco, you know, that was an inspiration in terms of the happy quality we wanted to bring to a sci-fi movie, but uh, also that kind of retro sensibility. Yeah, thank you. They'll, they'll bring you a mic. I can't speak loud enough. It's a small enough <laughs> here. It's small enough here. It's oh. maybe we'll oh. get to you next. Oh. Hi, Kayla. Great yeah. film. Thank you. Over here. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Are you going? There you go. Okay. Um, what is one of your um, greatest challenges creating this film? And then on the flip side, one of your favorite things you would say to actors that maybe another experience that really stood out? Um, one of the the, the, I'll tell you that the greatest thing was working with this great cast. You know, I, I'll, well, I'll tell you a little bit about the casting. You know, it, to me, it, the biggest challenge is finding the right tone for a movie. I like comedy, but I don't like yuck, yuck, you know. Uh, <laughs> there's a certain kind of comedy I don't like. Um, so finding the right tone to be funny, you know, even physical comedy I like, but it, it needs to have a kind of social message behind it or a social observation, let me put it that way. Um, so that's always a challenge in the beginning, finding the right tone. Originally, the, the script written by Floyd Byers and Laurie Frank um, was originally set in Manhattan. And I thought, you know, I had done two other movies in Manhattan, and somehow this didn't, having an android in, Man, in a lab in Manhattan, I, I mean, maybe someone else could make it work, but I, you know, I just thought it'd be nice to kind of go someplace with a technicolor sky, and, yeah. you know, again, the red Cor Corvair, I guess it is. Um, you know, so finding the right tone starts from the script, and then getting the right team together who are all on the same page about what, what you're trying to create. Um, so that's, I guess that's the biggest challenge right from the start. And how did you meet John Lodge? Oh, and so it, interestingly, I'll, I'll, yeah, good one, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, I'll tell you who else was, I, that I met with uh, who could have been the android. Um, I did meet with Rutger Hauer, Oh. And, and I thought he was, he, he's wonderful in Blade Runner and many other movies. I thought he would be, I had this technicolor vision of the movie and I thought he might turn the character too dark. And I liked him and he, he yeah. could have done the part, but, but I thought it would be too dark. I also met around this time, Back to the Future had come out. I met with Crispin Glover, who wanted to play the role. I could totally see <laughs> yeah. that. And he was charming, but I thought he was maybe a little too quirky, a little <laughs> on the weirder side. And then I thought that, you know, maybe, you know, the android's a little weird already, that right. if I cast a weird actor playing a weird android, it might <laughs> just be off the chart weird. Right. <laughs> um, those were the, the two main ones. There were, there were some other people along the way, but those were list. the two that could have been. And then I met with, with Malkovich, and I thought that there was something interesting because he could play goofy. He's, he's, he's handsome, but not Kendall handsome, you know? He's, he's a little off, and I like that. <laughs> but, but he still is handsome, you know? He's tall, he's, you know, blonde, and, yeah. you know, he has, he has all the... The, he the right elements, he, yeah. he checks the boxes. 
but but um, and also he was a theater director, and I like collaborating with people who can be real collaborators. Mm -hmm. You know, so I thought that uh, you know, and I like being around you know actors who ask right the right questions, and I just thought he would be a fun person to work with. Um, we're gonna get you the mix. Uh, I've, I've uh, been lucky enough to know Anne since 1980. I'm a musician. I've played with her. I still play with her in high school. Yeah. For wow. For years. Um, when she was, when we visited her last, she gave me a cop, Blu-ray copy of the movie because she doesn't own a Blu-ray player. So I'm hoping you sign it so I can send it back with a Blu-ray player to her in LA so she can actually watch it. Uh, Absolutely, but, hands so, down. So, uh, yeah. but I again. I saw it when it first came out because we knew Anne, and it was amazing to see it again because just as you said, there's so many small detail. Yeah. And of course, uh, I didn't know she drove stick, which is an interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and the, yeah. the choice of the Corvair is also iconic because yeah. it was unsafe that it yeah. was the Ralph Nader car, and yeah. you know it was like to see it like drove driven recklessly kind of. You know, yeah. Did you just like, say it was like, the Ralph Nader like, car? Like, well, it was, <laughs> it was the, yeah. Is that the one? Yeah. yeah the seatbelt. Yeah. Ralph's yeah, so yeah. it was like really interesting yeah. that that choice yeah. of car. I mean, yeah, was yeah. Was that intentional? Well, that was working with Barbara Ling. Uh, oh, okay. the pro that was a production design uh, choice. <laughs> yeah, she, she presents different options, and then I pick what I like, and, or she convinces me that I'm wrong, and <laughs> <laughs> pick something else. But you know, again, talking about working with um, smart actors, there's so many little funny details that Anne brought to the character. The Rolodex bracelet. That was Anne. I love you know, she so had much. we gave her a Rolodex because Rolodexes are fun, but she was the one it wasn't in the script. She yeah. was the one that decided to wear it as a bracelet. So when you're working with people who are all on the same page, they bring those little touches. I mean I toured with her in Europe. I mean we did thirty shows, we toured all over the the She's great. The, oh, amazing, She's great. amazing person. Also, just one. Yes. I was with her uh, when she was inducted to the West Virginia Music Hall of Fame. We performed together there, and it's the hospitality and the person she is is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, come up to me afterwards, and I'll. Fantastic. For her. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Do we have time for one more? Could I? This okay. Right, All right. There. You. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait for your mic. Hey. Um. So one of the many things I love about your movies is like, I always say recycling of actors, but like seeing them again in other films. And you already mentioned Laurie Metcalf and yeah. Anne, um, yeah. but also the big part of Susan Berman um, yes. as the sister yeah. from Smithereens. Yeah. Um, her look was very interesting. And yeah. I was wondering like what the inspiration for like the blue eyebrows and blue hair and the blue ears Came yeah, from. was that was she rocking that at the time or no? That was a, you know a directorial choice, um, but but the reason was again because I love um, contrast. To me, movies one of the elements that makes stories and movies good is is conflict and contrast, <laughs> and I love that you know Anne was this professional working woman and her sister was this kind of blue-haired uh, you know punk and and the mother was sort of a <laughs> you know somebody who you know just wanted her well one daughter to marry well and the other one not to get married at all to the wrong person in her mind yeah. um, so that that kind of family dynamic really interested me but but going back to using actors again. I mean, when you have a great actor, you know, like Laurie Metcalf and Desperately Seeking Susan playing that sister role, you wouldn't think that she would be this character here and then in, um, oh God, what's the great, the Greta Gerwig movie? Lady Bird. Lady Bird, you know, that, that was a, or, you know, a, a different kind of Laurie Metcalf. You know, when you find somebody who's just wonderful, uh, you want to work with them again. And interestingly also, uh, Glenn Headley, who passed away sadly about a decade ago, was married to John Malkovich at the time we were filming this. So
So it was sort of fun for them to watch their dynamic, not just yeah. as actors, but I see little things that she did that I think, <laughs> you know, just came out of their personal relationship. Amazing. And my last question is about the dog. Um, because I, when we talk about seeing things on screen, I did not notice the dog next to John Malkovich when he was on the apartment floor with his oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I just thought it was so funny that the dog was just sort of hanging, hanging out there. Well, the dog was their dog. That was John Glenn's dog. Okay, okay. <laughs> there you go. I was like, this dog is just so, it's just there. And I yeah. really like that. And I'm, Yes. Traumatic events. Yes. 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 Oh, thank, oh, I also just want to mention Susan has a book that is coming out in June. And so um, well, that's really seeking something. And I can't wait for it. And um, I hope that when it comes out, you all grab a copy. Is there anything you want to say about that? No, okay. just you can pre order it now if you'd like. <laughs> but um, hopefully, you'll find it interesting about behind the scenes stuff and also you'll hopefully you'll find it um you'll be able to relate to it on different levels and, and also find it entertaining so thank you and thank you very much. Thank you.